Welcome to the Equipping You in Grace podcast, hosted by Dave Jenkins. The Equipping You in Grace podcast is a podcast about helping Christians develop a biblical worldview in a conversational tone about issues inside and outside the church. Now, for today's episode, let's join our host, Dave Jenkins. All right, guys. Well, welcome back to the Equipping You Grace podcast. My name is Dave, and I'm the host for this podcast. And with me today, I have my friend Christine. Christine, welcome back to the show. Hey, Dave. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really looking forward to our conversation today. Yeah, me too. Me too. It's uh, always good to talk with you. Can you uh, just catch us up on what's been happening since we last talked? I think it was about a year ago on you know, your life, marriage, ministry, and uh, what projects you're working on these days. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, my name is, well, Christine. And for those of you who don't know me, I'm a married mother of three, and I am the outreach director for the Institute for Biblical Counseling and Discipleship, as well as the podcast host for that organization. And so my podcast is the Hope and Help podcast, where we have biblical conversations about life's challenging problems. And so that um, just in and of itself, those two roles have been keeping me very busy, um, along with the family life and things we've had going on. Um, And right now we're preparing to head out to biblical counseling conferences in North Carolina. So it's a busy time. Um, And yeah, recently just some projects, really the only project I've been focusing on as of late has been this mini book that we're here to talk about. Um, It's a really important subject to me personally, and uh, I've been trying to be faithful to um, seeing it through to the end, even though life sometimes gets in the way. So, um, yeah, that's kind of just what I have immediately going on. And then some other projects coming down uh, the pipeline here, Lord willing, if they will get done. But I am in the process of uh, I'm halfway through my supervision hours for ACBC certification. So that's for those of you who aren't familiar, um, Association of Certified Biblical Counselors. So I'm working toward that. And then I also serve my local church as a biblical counselor and a leader in our women's care and discipleship ministry. Oh, wonderful. Praise the Lord. So glad yeah. to hear that. I didn't, I didn't yeah. know that. So that's new. That's, that's yeah. really cool. Awesome. Yeah. Very exciting. Very exciting. Very cool. <laughs> Love hearing that. All right. Well, can you uh, tell us about this new mini book that you've written with Shepherd's Press? Help, I've been diagnosed with a mental disorder, why you wrote it and how you hope it'll be received. Yeah. Well, I love this series of books, the Lifeline mini book series. And I know that you have you know, interviewed other authors who have contributed to that uh, that series as well. And so I'm very thankful for the opportunity to have been able to ri- write a resource on this particular topic, which, you know, looking at the title seems a little bit broad, but that's for a, a reason. And so the title, Help, I've Been Diagnosed with a Mental Disorder, um, the reason I titled it like that was so that it would be broadly applicable because I truly feel, you know, and written this out of my own lived experience and we'll go into that, you know, through our conversation, but um, that, you know, as someone who is walking through the process of, you know, they have sought psychiatric care for one reason or another, the doctor has determined, you know, we're going to put this label on you. We feel like your symptoms fall into this category. So for that person walking through that experience, it can be a really awful, <laughs> an awful thing to go through and leave you with a lot of questions, doubts, especially if you're a Christian too, like thinking, you know, how does my faith in Christ even intersect with this experience and the problems that I'm facing? And so my heart for writing this resource really comes out of my experience of being multiple times labeled with a mental disorder and feeling those questions. First, actually, Dave, as an unbeliever, as I was a, when I was a teenager um, and being labeled with a variety of different um, you know, issues at that time and, and going through hospitalization as well. Um, but then fast forward to into adulthood and, and coming to know Christ and being a disciple of Christ um, and then going through that process again, which was awful. Um, but having that perspective of faith that second time around, God really used that um, to minister to me in powerful, honestly, healing, transformative ways um, 
And so I want to share that through the mini book, things that God comforted me with, stabilizing biblical truths that he ministered to me through his spirit um, that really enabled me to interpret what I was going through um, and its impacts on my future and even my present day through a biblical perspective, you know, the perspective that God gives us in his word. And so um, how I hope it's received, well, gosh, I don't know how it will be received, but um, I'm praying that this will be a tool that I think for the person who has lived through this kind of experience, I hope that it will um, invite them to Christ's counseling table, offer them comfort and hope, but then to practical next steps in the process of their, you know, walking through a post-diagnosis journey for people who are helpers um, or who are counselors themselves. I hope that this tool would be, you know, one of many um, to just start a conversation of about coming to Christ's counseling table, right? Because that's really what my, my heart is here for this book is to demonstrate that um, among other things, that God's word does speak into these experiences and gives us what we need to have hope for the future and meaningful help for the day. Um, so in a nutshell, <laughs> that's that's my hope. And, and we'll see how the Lord, you know, resolves to use it. That's wonderful, friend. Wonderful. Praise the Lord. Well, how do you, how does knowing our identity rooted in Christ help those with a mental disorder? Well, I can speak personally of how it was, you know, tremendously um, important and, and really a pivotal turning point for me um, when I was hospitalized that second time as a believer. And I mean, one of the very first things that I had to wrestle with was the fact that, you know, in common cultural language, you know, the way that we talk about um, or the way that most people hear these types of conversations or, or have these type of conversations is, you know, the labels are, it's almost as if they become who we are. They're descriptive of, I am this kind of a person. You know, um, for me, I was uh, diagnosed at the time with bipolar disorder too. And so, you know, in, in conversation that could tempt people to say, you know, Christine's bipolar or could tempt me to say, I'm a bipolar. And so just, and that's the, the way that we hear these conversations, you know, being had. And I didn't want that. I ha and I don't know if that was just my own stubborn spirit or just like a refusal to be labeled, but I just didn't want that. I'm like, this is, is this really who I am? Do I really need to embrace this mentality as this term is all defining? It's, it's going to dictate my destiny. It determines my identity. Like it was something I really had to wrestle with. And as I did, you know, the Holy Spirit just continued to minister to me through God's word, through the reminders that my truest identity is not found in some man-made, you know, ever evolving label, as we know mental disorder labels are constantly evolving, you know, and, and, and sometimes, or oftentimes based on, you know, um, subjective experiences. And so I just, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the reminder that, um, you know, nothing about my identity in Christ changed just because a doctor decided to say that these symptoms qualify you for this label. And because of that, and, you know, through the scriptures, the, the Holy Spirit testifying to our hearts that we are, in fact, in Christ, children of God, that my biggest label, my highest and greatest label is I am a child. I am his beloved. I am in Christ, part of his body. He dwells in me, like all of these benefits and realities, you know, that um, that Christ you know, one for us, right? Through through his perfect life and sufficient death and victorious resurrection, like they just came to the forefront and really just squashed in my own experience that temptation to begin to start to process my problems, process my world, process my relationships through a perspective of a label as opposed to the way God instructs us to interpret our problems and our realities here on this side of eternity, which is through the lens of his word, through the lens of, or through the truths of his character. I could continue on and on, but this, yeah. is, a, this yeah. is a timed program. <laughs> so I talk more about it in the book, but um, yeah. that's just kind of my guttural 
reaction to that question. Yeah. yeah. No, that's, that's good. You know, growing up, I was diagnosed with ADD and then ADHD and then bipolar. And, um, I actually got off the medicine as a 16, 17 year old, a nurse said, you don't, you don't have any of those problems actually. Um, she was a neighbor. And so I, I haven't been on medicine or nothing, you know, since then I, um, you know, and I, I feel actually fine. You know, I was actually on Wellbutrin and Depico and Zoloft as a teenager. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and they actually put cancer patients for our listeners that don't know, those are what they actually put cancer patients on all three of those. So they thought I was like suicidal. I didn't feel like I was suicidal and there, there was things for that. My parents were going through a divorce, but I've also seen, you know, I worked as a paraprofessional. I don't know if you knew that, but, um, I've seen, you know, that the, those labels just attached to kids and they, they, we put dump kids like me. I was dumped in a special ed class, you know, cause I was essentially less than, and I was bored out of my mind in that class too, which is why I read it in the roots was why I just read books in the class and drove my teachers crazy. Um, but you know, then I've also seen it with, you know, my parents and their, their memory issues. And, you know, we just attach labels to people and that, that becomes like, who they are and everything that they're about, you know, and I think that that's, I think that that's really sad and it's tragic. It's almost like, especially like with kids who, you know, do have special needs, they actually have real issues. And, you know, that's, that's, there's difference there, you know, between somebody that got, Mm -hmm. didn't need the medicine and somebody who really does. And so I'm not against the medicine at all, but I'm, but I am saying, you know, like the identity that we have as Christians is, it's rooted, like you said, so beautifully, it's rooted in Christ. We have union with Christ. And that's a, that's a beautiful and a wonderful thing. And, you know, we, we should, we should treat people that, and we'll talk about this in a minute about the church and stuff. We should treat people, you know, in, in with dignity and value and worth, whether they're a Christian or, or not, because we're in Christ, we, we have that value and we can add that value, you know, to their life by treating them and seeing them in a, in a way that honors them as a person made in, in the image and likeness of God. So I, I just, I just wanted to add that to, to what yeah. you said. Well, I think even just building off of what, what you're talking about, Dave, I think is a really great point because, you know, in my research for writing this book, I came across a particular quote I have in the book where a, a, psychi- a psychiatric researcher says, you know, in talking about, the the negative impacts of mental disorder labels and and one of the things is that he said is this they're sticky and stigmatizing and not very helpful with helping people to respond to their problem and i love that phrase sticky and stigmatizing because the thing is is that the way that it is often approached um could make the person who has been labeled feel as though this is now a problem that i'm going to have for the rest of my life Hmm. And now for some people, that may be something that they continue to struggle with for a very long time. Like you, you know, you've had uh, someone on here about, you know, Alzheimer's or, or so something, there are things that yes, you know, there, there may be lifelong ramifications, but for the most part, that's not that's not the case for everyone. And so to paint in such broad strokes that um, the way that, you know, these types of labels tend to do, and and, it's just, it's for the person who is experiencing it, they can feel like, oh no, now this is, this is going to be a part of me forever. And I had to wrestle with that too. I had to, can I, you know, the thoughts of, can I really, is anything going to really change? Am I going to be able to change? Is, am I going to be always on a medication, always having these experiences? Cause it feels like that way in the moment, right? When you're first going through, it feels like it's never going to get any better. Um, and so that's just some of the things that we address in the mini book, uh, and I think it's just part of a healthy conversation moving forward is is recognizing that, you know, for many people, change, progress, yes, is possible. Healing is possible. We don't need to feel chained or locked in to these labels because, as I say in the mini book, you know, they do not ultimately even dictate our destiny, especially in Christ. We know um, that that this is not the end of our story. It's just it's just part of it. Yeah. And this this is such an important conversation because, you know, over the last year and a half with my father and my even my 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 mom, I've just seen and I've heard and and talked to a lot of people um, in relation to him, um, his issue, my father's issues with dementia and the, the, the issue of, of mental health is, 
it's it's probably the biggest one of the biggest issues that that we as Christians are actually and I hate to say it this way we're failing in in so many ways failing like abysmally failing uh, to lead out in in the in the open and and really speak to I think I'm not saying that there's not conversations happening about around it but I'm saying like we should be leading uh, as Christians in this area and I don't think that we that we are that's that's my opinion my perspective on it but you know how should we so i guess even the question is how should we as christians uh be speaking to this issue because it is a growing issue you know hospitals are filled with people with memory care and all these issues so how should we as christians be speaking to that well you know i think when you you talk something about like memory care, that's one end of a spectrum. That is, so when we talk about mental disorders and I you know, need to make the disclaimer, I'm not an expert, I'm not a doctor, I don't have medical training. And so <laughs> I am not your person for getting into the particulars. There are a lot of more qualified people than me for those conversations. However, based on what I do know, um, and also my personal experiences, uh, you know, when we talk about the term mental disorder, that encapsulates um, from a psychiatric standpoint and definition or framework, you know, I think hundreds, I don't know how many exactly labels there are in the DSM-5, which is considered to be the Bible of psychiatry, um, but not, there's a spectrum, not, not every, uh, some of, on one end, you know, are some of those labels are considered, you know, more moral in nature. And then on the other end, you have things like you're talking about situations that do involve significant biological components. So they're not all the equal. Um, Absolutely. And, and but our conversations can tend to treat them as though they are equal and that, you know, everyone needs to follow this route uh, forward for, you know, um, for seeking care in that area. And I think it's just so nuanced. And it just when we take broad approaches like that, we miss the person, we mm -hmm. miss the sufferer and their individual unique experiences. We miss, you know, their social context, their upbringing and, and all kinds of things. People are so complex. And we talk about it in, you know, the mini book very, very briefly. We're so complex. We can't be easily summarized summarized by a particular diagnostic label. And so I think just when it comes to what the church can do to help um, its people in this area, I think number one, and it may seem like the most obvious thing, but is to just help to develop from the pulpit and then an explicit discipleship relationships, a good theology of suffering and of sorrow and of grief and preparing mm. her sheep, the churches, you know, the, the flock, right? Jesus's flock to go through very difficult things in life and not, you know, preach the expectation that to be blessed by God is to live a life that is free of suffering and disease and conflict and, you know, devastation. Like that's not the scriptures. That's not Jesus's warning that in this world, you will have trouble, you know, mm -hmm. and you will be sorrowful. You will lament. And so um, I think starting from there, uh, that's step one, right? Because equipping people to face suffering um, is important. And mm -hmm. I think even I was, Dave, researching for an article a couple of days ago, and there was a statistic that said that 33% um, of patients out of like 200,000 patients that were surveyed or at least tracked electronically through these researchers, 33% of COVID patients six months after their infection were diagnosed with a neurological or mental disorder. And so I'm not a doctor to interpret those results, but I mean, I think we could just imagine that having that type of experience, especially if you have been hospitalized and intubated and the trauma and the grief and how that flipped your world upside down. Like if people aren't equipped to, to process, to know how do I process this through God's character through how do I interpret my circumstances through his promises and the hope and help that he offers. It's not to say that we'll do it with a smile on our face or that we'll do it without crying, but just getting people equipped to face that kind of suffering and know that something 
it, when it comes, it's not that something strange is happening, right? Um, and mm. if we're in Christ, we can know that something hard is happening, but mm. something redemptive is being done through it. And mm. I think that that's a missing perspective that mm. a lot of us, you know, even as Christians, we need the constant reminder. But if we don't know Christ, then that's not a perspective at all that we have. And so mm. then isn't it any wonder that we sink into despair or hopelessness or, you know, want to slip into um, or find ourselves slipping into addictive habits, self-injury and and things of that nature. So that's just a real small off the cuff <laughs> answer. No, that's but. so it's so important what you said, because like people, like you said, are, are complex. And what we do in the church today is we say, oh, well, you're you're we you even we even talk in these ways. Right. Like I've been in the church my whole life. And, and, and a Christian, the majority of my life. And we even talk about, well, here's what works for me. And then people try that. Right. And then what, what do they end up doing? They end up, they end up failing at what that person was successful at doing because instead of, instead of give modeling is so important, but we only model, we don't instruct them on the general principles. And that's where, you know, we, we fail, we, we fail and to, to actually help somebody because what works for me isn't probably not going to work for you because you have a different way of learning or a different way of receiving information and a different way of communicating and a different way of, you know, everybody does uh, of processing information. You know, that's just how, our brains are, are all wired where we have the same brain, all of us, but how, how that functions and how we process that information is, is totally different. And, and what mm -hmm. you're hitting on, you know, that, what that does is it, is, is it hits on your point about, you know, how do we care for people? Well, we have to understand what their issues are and we have to understand, you know, what, what, what pressures, what triggers they have. And, you know, especially with, you know, mental health and I'm not a doctor at all, you know, I have no medical training other than I studied psychology and biblical counseling a lot. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I can say that too, just for our listeners. And, and I think that they know that, but um, you know, it's, it's so, it's so important to take a, as you're talking about that, that whole person approach um, and to see, see that person, you know, that 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 kid who has that 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 issue with autism or something like that or or even the adult with memory care as you talked about the whole spectrum you know there's still a person made in the image of god and and they need christ and you know if they know christ then the church should come alongside them and and help them and support them and and so you know the church has always done a good job we've always been with the ones who started the hospitals the universities and the whole the whole thing and and so we should be leading in in these in these areas and i just i just hope that 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 more people will step up and and speak to these issues because we have good answers um and we have the the hope and the help that that these people that have a mental disorder that they they they, they really need and and mm -hmm. um they they need care and, and support so right yeah yeah. Well, we, we've talked a lot about the local church and supporting them. Um, you talk also in the book, and I like this, uh, why, why, why should we trade the, the fix-it mentality for glorif the glorifying God mindset? Yeah, well, that was something I really struggled with. <laughs> to, and I think, to be honest, what even contributed to that second hospitalization as a disciple of Christ, because, you know, through my adult life, I had constantly um, battled against depressive lows and just that kind of volatility, emotional volatility, I guess you could, you could say. Um, and so when I came to be a Christian, you know, and I had, I was, oh man, it was, it still is so great, but just that zeal, right? That passion for this new faith and and learning about the God of the universe and who I am and him and who he is to me. Like that was a really invigorating time. But I think what in all of that zeal, what I didn't quite understand was that, or maybe I had it in my head, but it hadn't worked to my heart yet, was the reality that some things when we come to Christ may instantly change by the grace of God, but he continues to peel back the layers of our heart as we are sanctified or we grow in Christ likeness through, you know, different experiences and, and our constant, you know, abiding in him through his word and, and all of that. And so as time grew on, 
went on, um, I didn't know it at the time, but I was really trying to use God and the scriptures to produce within me a kind of emotional prosperity to -hmm. the point where it's like, well, if I just do this thing right, if I just, you know, do the right steps and have the right faith and figure out the right strategies and do the right worksheets and read the right books, then I won't ever have any sadness. I won't ever feel any feelings of grief. I will just live on this plane of like ecstasy, you know, like emotional bliss all the time. Right. And I mean, that's a dangerous goal. And I found out the hard way about it because ultimately when that is your goal, you're fix it. I'm going to fix this problem, whatever it is. You know, for me, it was the majority of it was depression for other people listening. It may be other different things like panic attacks or eating, you know, disordered eating or whatever it might be. Um, but when the goal is this thing must be out of my life or life is not worth living, that's danger. That's where I got to, to the point where I was considering and even thinking about ways to die. And mm. I don't say that tritely, I, I, in all honesty, and it's hard to talk about, but it's true. Because whenever we are constantly meditating and trying to figure out how can I fix myself with the right amount of steps, with the right things, if I just do it, I can pull myself up by my bootstraps and this won't keep happening. I'll learn, I'll do better next time. I'm going to try, 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 right? That puts all of the onus for transformation on my own strength, my own power, my own wisdom, my own abilities. And the thing is, is that God cares about us too much to let us continue living like that. That's Mm -hmm. not freedom. That's Mm -hmm. not rest. That's not peace, you know? And so the fix it mentality is only going to lead to further hopelessness and despair as we battle these kinds of perplexing, overwhelming problems. We have to know that um, God is our help, that we can turn to him. And so the whole idea of trading fix it, that fix it goal for, you know, what can I do to glorify God in this problematic moment that I'm in, right? Because fix it goals even could be, uh, my goal is not to have this label anymore. Okay, well, that's a very broad goal that probably takes some period of time, you don't really know, right? Like that's, that's looking into the future, right? And not to say that goals for the future are bad, but um, we don't know what God's plan is for the future. And so I think part of it is shrinking it down to I, what can I do to be faithful and obedient right now with this emotion, right now with this overwhelming feeling, you know, how can I take refuge in Christ? How can I bring this through prayer to God and and say, help Lord, you know, when I, when I mess up, when I sin, how do I, you know, how quickly am I coming and saying, God, here I am again. And I don't want to be this way. And I'm struggling with this, you know, this thing that is feeling like it's, it's enslaving and I need your help and then talking to him about that. So it's just a totally different mindset um, because glorifying God, it, the way I present it in the book or, um, you know, is sometimes as simple as just coming to him in the moment of despair and distress, mm-hmm. right? And, and really in our heart of hearts coming to him and say, God, I need you. <laughs> I cannot do this without you. And I'm going to resolve to wait I'm going to wait for this help. I'm going to trust that you are here with me and helping me, even when I don't feel it, even when I don't see it, you're up to work. uh, You're up to a good work. You're doing something good. I trust you today. And I trust you for my tomorrow. And so then all of a sudden, Dave, it becomes this redemptive experience where we are actually maturing spiritually instead of killing ourselves because we continue to struggle and we don't want to go through that anymore. And that is an understandable, that's understandable. This is hard. Um, But even in our heart, God meets us and helps us and is using it to conform us to the image of his son. And that perspective for me uh, just totally changed everything. Once Once I came to realize that I could choose in that moment, right? I can't choose to fix all my problems in one day. But in this moment, I can choose to come to Christ and rest and find peace and hope in him and his promise to do what he says he's going to do in my life. Um, 
once I, once the spirit made that true to me in the deepest sense of the word in this context, um, yeah, I was never the same. That's, that's really, really good. What do you mean by engaging God in our experience? What, what does this exactly look like? You know, I think a lot of people might be mm-hmm. confused, you know, oh, well, mm-hmm. you're talking about your experience. Where's, where's the Bible come into play into that? And what is the relationship between the two? Yeah, well, I, I, the whole engaging God term, I think I first got the word even engaging from Alistair Grove and, um, And Winston Smith wrote a book called Untangling Emotions that was very, very excellent. And uh, and so I use that. They talk about engaging our emotions and engaging God. And so I got that phrase, I believe, from them. But the idea, you know, is, I think, found all over the scriptures. And I present it in the mini book in terms of, you know, the Lord's constant invitations to come, you know, come to me sit at my table, come and find rest, come and listen, you know, come and find refuge. Like there's just always this posture of God's heart towards us where he is inviting us into his divine hospitality. And so when I say about engaging God in the book, I'm, I'm really not even trying to say, um, let's tackle everything you've got going wrong right now and figure out how you can work with God to make it right. All right. I'm, I'm trusting the work of the Holy spirit to work through this book. And then hopefully the reader is working with a biblical counselor or a mentor who can, you know, continue on in the discipleship process, but just for the, the, between the reader and I, I'm trying to get them to, or at least encourage them, you know, to know God's heart for them in the midst of their struggle. And he is constantly waving them, come, let's talk about, you know, he says, come, let us reason, right? I mean, I'm sorry, I don't have scripture references because I'm not going off of notes, but that's in the Bible, I promise. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, it is. Uh, you could Google it. And so um, just all of these invitations. And so I think for when we think about engaging God in our experience, uh, the various problems we're going through, if we have been labeled with a mental disorder diagnosis, um, you know, first it just becomes a posture of the heart, right? And I heard once it put this way that Christian maturity is, you know, can be measured by the length of time that we when we have a problem to the length of time when we come to God with this problem. And I found that so true in my own life. Um, And I've seen him help me to turn to him more quickly in the midst of overwhelming emotion or angry, you know, outburst, or even in conflict. And recently, you know, the conviction of, you know, needing to make reconciliation and ask for forgiveness when it's my part to do so Um, just things like that. And so conditioning a reflex of the heart, and engaging God also in the book, I just talk about, you know, that can look like just abiding in Christ, right? Because when we abide in Christ, we are spending time, you know, in God's word or with his people or somehow just through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, we are in fellowship with Christ and one of the many means of grace he gives us to do so. And that is how we experience progress on this journey is that we are transformed as we are continually in his presence and in his word. And so what does it look like for me in the moment to be in this problem that I'm having and, and coming to God with it and talking to him about it? And most of all, what is he speaking into it? Right. Cause it's not just a one-way dialogue. Cause I could, say all kinds of stuff, but doesn't mean it's helpful, right? So I want to say my piece, but then I want to also, you know, be still. And like I said, rest and wait and humble myself to really, truly hear what, what God is speaking through his word. And to be honest, in those moments, sometimes it doesn't feel like God is there speaking, right? But he's given us his word. And so even if it doesn't feel like it, we can trust that when we open up our Bible, that's him giving us a word of comfort, a word of consolation, or a word of correction or counsel. So just, yeah, that's kind of where I'm going with that. And then we explore what that might look like practically, you know, in, in the mini book itself. That's, that's really, really good. Really good. What advice do you have for, for those who have family members and friends who have recently been diagnosed with a mental disorder that, that might help them to walk alongside them with the grace of God? When I think about that question, I think the scripture that comes to mind most um, 
readily is First Thessalonians 5.14. And just that encouragement um, for, you know, brothers and sisters in Christ to, uh, to take on kind of four for care positions, you know, depending on the person that is in front of them, you know, where to uh, admonish the idle, to encourage the faint hearted, to help the weak, but all encompassing every one of those, whether they're idle, faint hearted or weak, um, to be patient with them all. And this is, you know, all coming from um, a, a posture of love, like love for our neighbor or for the person that we're caring for. And so I think if even we work backwards, you know, in that scripture, and we start off with patience, you know, recognizing that for me to care well for this person is going to require the patience of God working through me, because there's not a whole lot you're going to say or do in the particular moment of distress that is going to instantly solve this person's problem or make them change overnight. Right. And that's not that God doesn't charge us with that. You know, mm-hmm. we sometimes put that burden on ourselves thinking I can, I can change this person. I can, you know, scold, scold it out of them or give them enough Bible verses that this problem will be taken care of in a week. And that's just not like we've said, people are complex. This is not how these things work. And so just having, um, for me to speak to the person who, who is caring for someone, um, in this way, you know, patience, and there are great resources available on, on growing in patience. And God will use this particular person in your life to work on that particular uh, fruit of the spirit. But then um, remembering, too, that the person who has been um, labeled with a particular uh, diagnosis is suffering and yes, sin is probably involved, like it is involved every minute of the day when we live and breathe, even if we don't have a label, right? But they're suffering and um, just trying to take on that frame of mind of like, look, if if this person, I mean, I'm pretty sure they would probably rather not be dealing with these problems, you know what I mean? And so um, this having a, a heart of Christ toward them is to us to see them first as um Number one, if they're in Christ as a saint, right? Like this is a child, like we talked about, this is a child of God. Um, and not just in the general sense that the world uses, right? In the very specific sense that this person before the foundation of the world was chosen by God to belong to him. And then at some point in their life, he called them by name and now they belong to him. And it's beautiful. So to see them first through that lens and then say, okay, the saint of God, this child of God, this, this, this brother or sister who's part of the holy priesthood, right? Um, they're hurting and they're suffering and they don't know what to do next. And they don't know where to go to for help. And so how can I step in and help to shoulder that burden? Um, and, and not in a way that treats them as a person that needs to be fixed, but just, um, or a problem that needs to be fixed, but a, a person that needs um, love and compassion and encouragement, as the, as the Thessalonian scripture says. And so I think those are just some general en- encouragements. I think that was your question, right? <laughs> yeah, no, that's, okay. that's, that's good. You know, not what you just said there just a second ago about, you know, not not seeing them as somebody to, you know, fix up and, but to walk alongside of. And, and even, even, you know, we do have answers, but even just realizing that listening is, is just a valid ministry is speaking to them and, and then putting your hand and maybe on their, on their hand, you know, as appropriate, of course, you know, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. nothing inappropriate. I'm not advocating right. for anything mm-hmm. appropriate, but just like, just letting them know that you, you care about them, whether that's verbally right. or non-verbally and then praying for them. Um, you know, and we're talking, of course, when appropriately, we're, we're talking about, you know, if, if it's if you're a guy and you put a hand on on a lady's hand, you know, you, you don't want to do that. Well, you know, yeah. if you're if you're with a guy and you're a guy and you put, you know, your hand on his hand, like one of my pastors used to do, you know, that that's a that's an OK thing. We're, I'm just spelling mm-hmm. it out just so yeah. nobody's, about <laughs> it. you know, mansplain it as one of my friends, yeah. said, you know, whatever. But um. But yeah, no, it's 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 so it's so important that that we that we do care and that we do come alongside and you know especially with family members like I wouldn't be able to to go through and and ha- be able to do what I do you know if I if I if I if I've had to learn you know with my parents um, you know I can only handle it so much so many times a week you know being engaged in the issue. Um, because I already have so much and it's quite stressful often. 
and 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 also you know friends to talk with about these locally and around the country that that know quite a lot about this you know th- those kind of things have those kind of systems those things in place for yourself um you know, and, and it'll help, you know, because, you know, whether the wherever the person is, if it's your child or, or it's a family member or it's somebody that, you know, really well, it's going to the, these kind of things that the diagnosis, whatever it is, ADD, bipolar, a mood disorder or, you know, we're talking about a cognitive impairment like by mm-hmm. uh, like Alzheimer's or or dementia or something like that. Mm-hmm. You know, it's going to weigh on you and it's going to take up a lot of your time and it's going to take up a lot of you know, the, the, the thing, the resource, mental energy that you have and everything. And, and you're going to need that kind of support that the church, the church offers. Um, and, and um, I've, I've learned, had to learn that. And uh, I know others have. And so that, that would just be some of my encouragement just to, to somebody that's caring for you or about you, just, just be that kind of person that you want, you know, want, want somebody to care about you. You know what I mean? Like, right. just, just like, be that person that's in the word. That's why you should be in the word and praying yourself so that you have something to share with, with another person, you know, and, and that's mm-hmm. true whether they have a mental, mental disorder or, or anything, right. That that's just really basic. How do you want to be used by God? Uh, there's, there's a good way, you know? Yeah. Well, and even just quickly to build off of that, Dave, it goes to the point again of identity because, you know, if we're being honest, right. Uh, when we hear someone has been given a label, like what we're talking about, something that is a label of a mental disorder, it can skew the way that even caregivers now are viewing this person. Um, you know, and, and I have felt that uh, even years now, you know, praise God. I, I mean, after nearly two decades of struggling in the ways that I was, um, you know, it's been a number of years now where I'm not you know, Mm. by the, it's a, it's a miracle. Like it's the transforming grace of God that this is no longer something that I'm having to wrestle with. And it doesn't mean I won't have sorrows and other things in the future. Um, But it, it, this is not, you know, it was not definitive, like at all encompassing, like this is stamped forever. This is how it's going to be God. You know, I, I believe he, he gave me healing and he gave me counsel and he gave me, he equipped me to respond to some of, uh, you know, my overwhelming emotions in fruitful, redemptive ways. But so, but, but having said that, even now, all these years later, for those of us who have been even previously labeled, whenever that person is struggling again, then caregivers or pe- loved ones or people around them will, in my experience, tend to then fall back and say, oh, no, she's having an episode or, oh, no, he's, you know, he's he's backsliding, whatever. And maybe sometimes that might be true. But also, you know, I think it's just shrugging off. Well, no. This is a very valid reason to be upset. Someone just died (laughs) or no, this is a very valid reason to be upset, you know, or, or, you know, um, somebody is going through a very life-changing experience and that is stressful on anyone, you know? So just as a caregiver, uh, being careful how you are even filtering your perspective on your loved one, Um, because as the person who has been, you know, labeled in a particular way, um, they can sense that when you are interacting with them through that lens. And so it, it really, it really applies not only for the person experiencing it, but also for the person who is involved in their care. That's really, really good. Well, Christine, where can people go to find out more about you online, on social media or otherwise? And Mm -hmm. of course, maybe a little bit about IBCD as well. Yeah. So to connect with me, and I have a number of resources available on my website specific to this topic. And so you can find all of that relevant information um, on my website, which is Christine M as in Michelle chapel two piece two else.com forward slash help so that is where i have all the information about the mini book and all of the the interviews you know will be there and some videos that i have and anything related to this is on that page it's a resource page um and then I'll, of course I'm on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram as well. And all those links are on my website. And I do have a weekly email that I send out uh, for subscribers. 
who want to receive weekly biblical counseling resources on rotating topics. It's not always this topic. It's actually not usually ever this topic, but you know, it, it, it cycles through various things. Um, and also to stay up to date with the, like you said, the IBCD podcast. And so the Institute for Biblical Counseling and Discipleship, um, is a an organization one of the oldest biblical counseling organizations is actually a um a branch off of ccef it was uh, when it first started it was called ccef west and for those who are not familiar ccef stands for the christian counseling and educational foundation and so that's kind of how ibcd started but fast forward a few decades and here we are now and so um as an organization we offer training Training for individuals and churches who desire to grow in their ability to provide one another care and discipleship in the context of the local church. So whether you are just a ministry leader um, or a pastor looking to better figure out, hey, how can I care for someone who has been labeled with a particular mental disorder or they are, you know, haven't been labeled, but they're just going through a hard time and I, I want to be an encouragement to them. How can I can I help? Going to IBCD, we have a bunch of free audio resources that are organized by topic. We have blog articles, and then we have more official training um, that can be used as the training that is required for ACBC certification. Now, you don't need to go through that training um, to be certified. You can use that training just for your own personal benefit, um, but there are those who want to continue on in their equipping process and get certified. And so in that case, those materials, it's called the care and discipleship course. Those materials would be um, advantageous for you on that process as well. So gosh, that was a lot, but um, it's, hopefully, it's <laughs> wonderful. hopefully it's helpful. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Love hearing about it. Well, uh, you know, there's a lot that we could talk about. And just mm -hmm. as we wrap up, would you uh, give us some takeaways, Christine? Some takeaways. Gosh, I think my biggest takeaway for today is that if you have found yourself, you know, recently diagnosed with a mental disorder, I want you to know that that has not changed God's view of you. Mm -hmm. in, in his eyes, you are not disordered. You are his child. He is not sick and tired of you continually struggling within the ways that you are. He's not sick and tired of you coming to him with your problems. He's not sick and tired of you needing his help. And he just continues to invite you to come to him, come and listen, come and sit, come and let us reason together, come and let me tell you about how much I love you and how much my hope and my help for you is is endless. I'm faithful. And what I have promised to you, you know, he says he will do it. He will bring it to pass. And so that's probably my biggest encouragement. If it's for the listener who is the one who is going through this experience is just, you know, remembering the father's love and heart for you, um, I think was one of the biggest things for me. And it's hard to connect those dots when we're really in a dark place. Um, but it doesn't make it true. It doesn't make it any less true, right? It doesn't make it any less true. So that's my encouragement for you is just God doesn't view you any different. And none of the promises that he gave to you when you first put your faith in Christ um, are any different. All the promises remain because Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Like nothing has changed, right? It's just this is a new part of your story. He's folding it into his redemptive purposes for your life. And um, you can trust, you can trust the work that he's doing. Mm, so well said. Well, good, great job today, Christine. It's been a pleasure to be able to talk to you. Guys, um, we've been talking today with Christine Chapel about her mini book with Shepherd's Press and the Lifeline series. Help, I've been diagnosed with a mental disorder. I encourage you to pick it up and also to pick up many of the other volumes uh, in this series. I'm writing one mm -hmm. I've mentioned on contentment, um, and it's uh, it's a joy. There's, they're really good. They're short, they're about 50, 60 pages, and they will help you to become equipped. And uh, so go pick up Christine's and go pick up another one in this series as well. There's lots of different topics. So thank you so much for your time today, Christine. Thanks for having this conversation, Dave. I really enjoyed it. Me too. Thank you.
Thank you for listening to the Equipping You and Grace podcast. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe, rate us on the app, and share this with your friends and family on social media. If you want to find us on social media, you can find us on Twitter at Servants of Grace, on Instagram at Servants of Grace, or by searching at Servants of Grace on Facebook. You can also find this episode and many others like it on the front page of our website, servantsofgrace.org.